All right. Hi, everyone. Parsa Vahid of Strand Life Financial Group. I'm here joined again by Shadi Schaefer of the Elder Law and Asset Protection Center. She's an estate planning attorney. We did a introdu introductory video uh, last week, and I wanted to follow it up this week, kind of get a little bit more into the, the weeds and the details of exactly what the process would look like if you wanted to do an estate plan with Shadi or, or another attorney if you may have one that you're already working with. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Shadi, how are you? Good to see you again. Hi, Parsa. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate you guys over at Strand Life Financial. Thank you. Of course, of course. Um, so as I mentioned in the last video, we, we kind of talked about what exactly an estate plan is, the differences between a trust and a will. If you guys have any questions on that component, re re refer back to the old video. Um, there's some great information in there. But in this video, I know that there's a lot of chaos going on in the world with the virus and the pandemic. Uh, and I know you and I are both busy. Luckily, our businesses are kind of business as usual. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who are at home and they don't have um, much to do. Uh, and this is a video I'm hoping that will kind of light a fire under them to get their estate plan in order now that they don't have a million other things going on. Um, sure. So Shadi, if you can just Good talk point. a little bit about, you know, a lot of people are fearful that they, they don't want to be exposed to other people, but the fact that your firm can essentially do almost everything virtually, is that not right? Uh, exactly, Parsa. Not just myself, but there's actually a lot of estate planning firms out there that have really positioned themselves to be able to help clients from afar. And even before everything that was going on with the virus, uh, many of us um, estate planning law firms have been able to do things from afar through email, virtually, video conferencing, and so on. So there's a lot of options out there for people to still follow up and getting their estate plans in place without feeling like they have to put themselves at risk. So there are a lot of options, and I definitely suggest that people look into those options. Absolutely. Okay. Now's a better time than any. Fantastic. Fantastic. So let's do let's do a quick role play, Shadi. Let's say I, I call you and I say, hey, Shadi, I heard you on this fantastic video um, and I'm ready to do an estate plan. Talk a little bit about the process, what the client can expect in terms of the time frame, what questions yeah. they, they can expect to be asked, what questions to maybe think about before even calling you um, so that they're not overwhelmed. So if you can just touch on that. So. I think that's a great question, Parsa. And one of the first things I want to actually share is I don't come from a family of attorneys. My dad's a contractor, my mom's a beautician, and I sort of always approach the law with a real practical mindset. And so I feel that, look, as great as I might think I am in some ways or fun <laughs> to hang out with, other people aren't really looking to spend hours upon hours in my office. I have clients that we do have long meetings, but um, I really learned throughout the last 17 years that efficiency is key because people want to plan their vacations and other things more than they want to talk about estate planning, you know, death taxes and what to leave to their kids and things. That's not on the top priority list, unfortunately, for most Americans. So one of the things I did is for years, I worked on a really good intake sheet. Mm -hmm. And so to keep it really streamlined and to answer your question, let's say someone calls us, they can either call or email us. They go to our website, assetprotectioncenter.com. They can actually go online, put in an inquiry. We can follow up either via email or a phone call with them. And it's as simple as this. If someone actually wants to hire us to do their trust plan, if they fill out our intake sheet, which is just like 10 pages long, mm -hmm. we literally can do their plan for the most part with that intake sheet meaning mm -hmm. you as the client don't need to get anything else to me other than that intake sheet. And I've really worked on my sheet over the years to make it super easy so that you and your wife could fill it out in less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Granted, sometimes it might take a little bit longer if it's a unique mm -hmm. situation, right? I'm talking in general. Mm -hmm. You should be able to sit down with her and figure, you know, fill out the worksheet in 10 minutes. Um, other than a call together, go over the worksheet and talk about your plan. The rest is, we really could manage the rest of it on us. We look up the, let's say you own a home with your property address. I go through my title company, pull the deed for your property in order to include the property into the trust plan and so on. So the rest of the work is really on our shoulders. Yes. So we try to keep it pretty streamlined. So, I mean, literally a person can hire us over the phone or email, give us the filled out worksheet, and we literally could start working on their plan 
And right now, um, to be really honest, I'm trying to turn plans around within two weeks. I don't normally, yeah. yeah. Okay. So just to be clear, that's on a general case, right? But we're holding someone you to comes, that. It's two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Two if weeks. someone comes to me and they have a lot of corporations and a lot of properties, and I'm talking California properties, not other out of state properties yeah. and things. But for the most part, we can get their trust plan in place within two weeks. Actually, I just sent out a trust today and I had 48 hours to do it. That's oh, wow. a rare case, but it was for an elderly parent who is not doing well and oh. they needed to get the plan done fast. fast. Now, there's, there's fast solutions to those things. You know, like we're just doing the plan, but we're gonna do the deed for the property later. So it's kind of hard to explain, but if you put your plan in place today, just the plan itself, you're actually putting people in the plan in control so that the moment you become incapacitated or you pass away, your brother or your wife could sign documents for you to finish the plan if it wasn't mm. finished. Got so it. that's the power of a good trust plan. It's huge. It's a very powerful tool Got it. that most Californians need. Got so it. hopefully that helps answer the question. It does. Absolutely. Okay. So in regards to some of the questions in your intake sheet, for, so it's been a while since I've done my trust, but I remember some of the questions that, uh, thank you, some of the questions that kind of stood out to me that I, I would never have thought of otherwise were, you know, what happens if you become incapacitated and you are on life support? What do you want to happen? You know, normal everyday people don't think of these things, right? But that was one thing that really stood out to me in my memory. But what are some other questions that people should be thinking about? Just the discussion with your with your partner or your business partner or your family. Um, and obviously you want to sit down and really consult with one another and say, who's going to take care of our daughter? God forbid we both pass away. Who's going to then take care of our daughter if that person that we selected passes on before us? You know, yep. uh, so, so what are kind of the, I would say, the top three questions that you think people should be thinking about that aren't uh, common, you know, everyday logic? Okay. So right out the door, if I'm a single woman or person, I would, the first thing I would want to think of is, okay, if something happened to me today, who would I trust to manage my affairs, take care of me, make decisions for my health, my manage my bank accounts, keep paying the bills. Maybe I'm in rehab, whatever the case may be. Right. Or yeah. if I passed away, who do I want in charge to manage my house and my every, my stuff basically. Okay. So the first thing you want to think of is who's your point guard in a sense, who's the one person that you feel comfortable that you can trust to basically follow the wishes you leave in this trust plan. Really a trust is like a love letter. Okay. Yeah. Or it's a roadmap or a book of instructions is what I call it. So, and, and aside from that first person, I always push people to pick two people. So mm -hmm. a first option and a backup, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because my first option could be my sister, let's say, but then let's say I get in a tragic accident with my sister. Mm. So who now is going to be my backup if she was my first go-to? Right. Okay. So as a married couple, for example, you and your wife, you want to think of, okay, who's going to be the first person to make decisions if something happens to both of us? When you're married, it's always spouse for the other spouse, right? Yes. So something happens to you, your wife automatically makes decisions for you. Yes. Something happens to you, you make it for your wife. Now, when I say automatic, let me just take a step back. It's only automatic if you put it in writing in these documents. So let me just ma mention one okay. thing, because this is the biggest misconception out there. You and your wife, Parsa, don't have automatic rights to make decisions for each other. You have it now because you did your estate plan years ago. Mm -hmm. So you guys have appointed someone in your documents to make decisions, to appointed each other and someone else to make decisions right, for you. Right. But there's a lot of married couples out there that when I meet them for initial consults or I do video conference calls with them over the phone, they're like, wait a minute, we've been married for 50 years. Are you telling me, Shadi, that I can't make a decision for my wife and she can't make a decision yeah. for me? And I'm like, yes, exactly. Yeah. And they're always shocked to hear that. Yeah, you made so that. The, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, so the the first thing you really want to think of is who who are who are, who is the one or two people that I want to choose to act on me or our behalf if something should happen to us. Mm -hmm. And it could be people always go, well, I don't have a lot of family, or my family lives in England or something. It can be a best friend, a neighbor, it could be an accountant, it could be, you know, 
it doesn't have to be a family member, okay. your brother, an uncle, you know, so it's really, I tell them this better. You pick someone, whoever that is, than the courts picking someone. For that's you. for sure. I mean, come on, that's not, we, I don't ever want that for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So, and then you, you said two or three questions. Yeah. The other biggest component would be if you have children, whether they're minor or adult, how you want to leave your assets to them. Yes. Okay. That takes a little bit of a deeper discussion, but it could be something as simple as, do you want the money to go to them outright? If they're under 18, that can't happen anyways. Mm -hmm. So then you have to leave instructions for, okay, when my little boys are 21, when they turn 25, I want them to get money or I want them to get a certain money over time and things like that. So for people like us that have minor children, the money's held in the trust and it's mm -hmm. managed by maybe my sister or my brother or your brother or whoever, right? And, and they have to watch that money carefully for your daughter's benefit, for example. Mm -hmm. And then when she's an adult, the money can then be given to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are some other decisions that have to be made. But the biggest one is just the agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I had a client once that said, I have no clue what I want to do. I said, fine, let's pick your agents then. She's like, I can do my plan and I just have to pick my agents. I said, yeah. And that's what we did. She did her plan and she was going into surgery. This is a case of mine from a year ago. And it was a pretty intense surgery and she was worried. She was a single woman. That's why it was really hard for her. She was leaving money to nieces and nephews. She's like, I have no clue what I want to do. I'm like, pick two people. We'll figure out the rest. Yeah. We did it. We did it. Did the plan. And she waited, she recovered, she, everything went smoothly, thank God. And she came back about a year or two later and then she put more instructions in the plan to be real specific. Got it, got it, okay. I wanna quickly also just talk about, um, you know, what it looks like if you don't do this planning, what it looks like if you choose to put this off and, and God forbid that, that inevitable day comes earlier than you expected what mess you're really leaving behind. And I really want to paint this picture for people because people always put things off just because it's our natural tendency as humans. But I really right. want you to be aware, if you're a viewer watching this, of what you're putting your family through <clears throat> by not doing this planning. So paint a picture of kind of a, a worst case scenario. Person has some assets, um, has nothing planned, uh, and what that can really look like. Okay, this is a great question, Parsa. So the first thing I wanna share is this. If you have no planning, if you get ill or you get it, go into a coma, automatically you're having to deal with the court system and someone in your life has to be appointed as your conservator. So already that's a whole, whole boatload of problems. I mean, imagine I get, I'm in a tragic car accident on my way home today. I have no planning done. Not to mention, have I already put my family, I mean, my family's already gonna have to deal with the fact that I'm in a tragic car accident, right? Everything else aside going on, yes. right, today? Yes. Um, but now I'm forcing my spouse or my parents, let's say, to have to go hire an attorney and file a conservatorship to say, hey, courts, I want to make decisions for Shadi. She didn't put in writing what she wanted. Yes. She didn't appoint the person. So now the courts have to oversee it. Yes. to make sure I'm being cared for properly, right? How yes. do they know I don't have some crazy sibling that's like taking my money and I'm in some corner, right? Sitting there yeah. not being cared for. Yeah. So people don't understand the why behind it. And that's right. why I'm explaining that. It's yes. for all of our protection, okay? So conservatorship is one issue, okay? Just the ability to make financial, legal, and healthcare decisions for me. Now, if I died in this car accident, now there's another issue, probate. Mm. That is the worst process. I mean, I tell people one time this guy's like, so what? I die. I don't care. I'm like, okay, I guess if you don't care enough for the people you <laughs> left behind and all the stuff you worked hard for, then I guess so be it. But yeah. once I really explained to him the process and how expensive it is, probate in California is the worst state in the nation to go through the probate court system. So if I died in that car accident today, I own a business right? I'm 50% owner of Asset Protection and Elder Law Center. Um, I own a car. I have a bank account. I have an IRA. Um, I might have a house. That's a problem. Who gets yeah. all that? Yeah. Right. And by the way, people think, oh, well, you know, my mom died and there's no one else, just me, her one son. I should get it all. Well, yeah, you might get it all. 
you have to go through the court now for yeah. a year to two years. And I won't even begin to tell you how much that costs. Yeah. Just the hell, I call it just the hello entry fee. Just the entry fee is a minimum average cost of $3,000. Yeah. So I always tell clients, a trust is an investment in your life and the lives of all the people around you and your loved ones. If you have a business partner, you owe it to that partner to have an estate plan in place. If you have a spouse, you owe it to them. You could be a single guy. You know what? You owe it to your parents then. Because yeah. if you die as a single guy, your mom or dad has to step forward now. Hire an attorney and open probate. Who yeah. wants that? Nobody yeah. wants that. Yeah. So it's an important, it's, it's, it's very not important. a fun thing. It, I, you know, parts of the analogy I give is you don't get auto insurance hoping you get in an auto accident, right? You don't yeah. get health insurance hoping you get sick. You don't get life insurance hoping you die. You don't get an estate plan hoping you're, something's going to happen to you. You yeah. get those things to protect you when or if yes. life happens. That's yes. all. Absolutely. That's all. Absolutely. And I think right now, you know, there's a lot of people working from home. There's a lot of people with maybe a little bit of extra time. I know you and I are, are busier than ever. Our businesses are running smooth uh, just by the virtue of the nature of the business that we're in. But there's a lot of people um, that, that have some free time right now. And, you know, as a financial advisor, a financial planner, the first thing I tell a, a new client that walks in um, when they ask me, what should we invest in? I say, before we even get to that, you need to have six to nine, preferably 12 months of liquid assets in case situations like this happen. You want to plan for it. Then once you do that, we'll talk about all the other potential investments that we can put your money in. That's great right advice, now, Parson. Yeah, right now is definitely a time for people to plan their estate. It's not going to take you more than two weeks. We've, we're holding you to that. Um, and it can be done for the most part virtually. I mean, you, you can fill out the intake sheet, um, ask shoddy questions. Uh, and then the only thing that requires, I guess, in-person uh, contact is a notary. And you, you mentioned something off air that I thought was interesting. Let's say you're, you're a high risk person. You just can't afford to be exposed to anyone. The solution is the notary comes to your home. They, they slide the documents over. As long as they can see you, you, you hold your driver's license up, they witness your signature, and, and then you just, uh, the notary takes over the documents, puts this stamp on, and then boom, you're good to go. So there technically is a solution for everyone, um, even those who, who may not want to, to be exposed to anyone contact-wise. Is that not right? Absolutely true, Parson. A couple of points on that. If someone doesn't even want to have someone else touch those documents, technically speaking, they can print the documents that we send them at home. So if they really want like no contact, yeah. we even have a work around that too. Okay. And um, also we have options that if they want no contact with the notary, we can do plans where they're signing it and dating it themselves. And then they send it over to us. So there's no contact for them. Okay. Um, and we can process it on the back end and then we've got a plan to follow up to execute it at a later time when things have settled down. And so believe it or not, there are laws in place that um, a trust document can be signed and dated by the person and does not require legal notarization for it to be valid. Ultimately, you want that. That's the best plan and approach. But what I'm trying to share is, is we've got a lot of different levels, right? Yeah. You want real no contact. We've got that. You don't mind some contact. We got that. A week ago, we did a trust plan for a very elderly woman who ha is a very sensitive health condition. And the notary came to her door, didn't go inside. And we did it a very meticulous way where she felt comfortable. She used her own pen. Yes. She, you know, had the documents first. Then she gave it to Beautiful. the notary. The notary witnessed her license signed and took the documents back to our office. So the client doesn't even have those documents with her. So, and we're going to send it out in a few weeks when that period of that any <laughs> possible, you know, stuff could be yeah. on the documents is no longer there. So, right, right. Got it. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thanks so much, Shadi. I think uh, I just want to, you know, drive this point down to people. Uh, plan, 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 plan. Whether you're planning for your business, whether you're planning for your family or your, your estate as a whole, it's very important to always plan ahead. It, it, no one ever regrets doing the planning. Um, and, and the no. financial cost is, is nowhere near um, the, the cost that will be on your family once you put them in the mess. So um, if no. you take nothing Probate's from- Probate's very expensive. 
it, Very it, expensive. Yeah, and, and it's not only expensive, it's frustrating dealing with the courts, right? So. Well, right now, imagine, Parson, right now the courts are closed. Oh, so can goodness. you imagine, if you have a trust in place and a parent dies, by the way, two clients have passed this last week, not because of the virus, just for mm -hmm. old age, mm -hmm. but their families are okay because they have a trust in place. They yeah. don't even have to go through the court system to manage everything. Yeah. So it's such a blessing now more than ever. Absolutely. So it's, it's important. And, and like you said, it's, it's, we don't want you to necessarily call us. We just want you to get these plans in place. It's, Absolutely. It's Please yeah. do that. Well, again, thank you so much, Shadi. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Stay Martha. safe. And hopefully we'll see okay. each other in person soon. I know, right? <laughs> Definitely. We're never going to underestimate the power of hugs. Right. I know. Absolutely. All right, Barca. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Take care. Thanks for having me.